Welcome to the Find and Follow podcast, where we are all about helping you find and follow Jesus in your everyday life. Kyle and Scott back here with a guest today, Jesse Richner. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, we're excited that you're on the podcast with us. And uh, not just the podcast, uh, Kyle, but he's yeah, got an on, extra level of like, on welcome staff this. At, uh, at MC at the Old Mission Church, the newest staff member extraordinaire. Yeah, pretty pumped about it. Not this, Admittedly, this is my first podcast. Ever. Ever. That's okay. Done a fair amount of like... Facebook live stuff, oh, all right. but never a podcast podcast proper. Okay. Well, so, hey, you welcome. know. What do you call it? Podcast HQ? Yeah, this is the podcast, podcast HQ. HQ. Yeah, welcome aboard. We are here, present, accounted for. In studio. Yeah, in, in studio. In low budget studio. <laughs> this is a high quality oh, budget. Oh, high quality. We uh, just renovated this budget. We did. Re- I'm just, yeah. Mm-hmm. Last, uh, tw- in 2020, we renovated the HQ. The old HQ. Yeah, it worked out. Jesse and I were just talking about that before on air, and there's some doors that used to come in this room, and that door doesn't come in in this room anymore. That's yeah, true. I walked into the, the custodial closet several times, thinking yeah. it leads to this room. Yeah. Yes. Does and, not, in fact. And I just came out of there. He goes, hey, were you trying to get in that room? I was like, nah, I was putting the broom away. <laughs> yes. He knows better. I've done that many a times, too, because that yeah. fusion, I mean, I used to go out that back door because it was the most discreet way to exit this room when we were doing stuff for middle school and high school students, and so now it's like... This one in the back of the room is still discreet, just not as discreet. Yeah. And I get messed up all the time. Yeah, it's, you know, old habits. But anyway, Podcast HQ, Jesse, you've been on staff for a whole whopping week and a half, two weeks. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're yeah. coming up on two weeks there here, you man. Go. Time flies. It does. <laughs> it's funny how much happens in two weeks and just like how different you feel yeah. at a new place. You're here. From day one to today so jesse's doing groups gonna help people intentionally uh gather in community together and you've done ministry um non work in the valley uh you've been you're a hometown guy been around for a while uh i'd said on sunday that jesse and i actually grew up like in the same exact circle he was a year older than me in school and we didn't really even know it i knew he oh, looked really? familiar but I went home, looked at all my yearbooks, and there he is in every single one of what them. What do you know? And it's like, yeah, th- we yeah. were, we had the s- elementary, middle, pretty wild high school. Elementary and middle school. He went elementary to elementary and high middle, school. yeah. Oh, okay. Different high school. Um, but literally, I mean, I think we, were we had on the class- playground together. I like, think we had classes together. I didn't look at the band picture, but I think in his sixth grade band, he was playing saxophone and I was playing baritone. I think in the exact same band in the really? class. Definitely, really? definitely. Yeah, yeah. But did you know Kyle? I mean. At all? I'm pretty forgettable, you know. Yeah. So. There's a lot of kids. I, I, again, I, I feel like I remember him being like familiar. Like, oh, that guy's face looks familiar. Also, in school, you think about like you know people that are ahead of you a little bit, but you I can't I can't think of like a single person that was in great they were in grades behind me. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Right. Other than bro- siblings of like, oh, my friend has. Yeah, a, yeah I, I don't remember. The, yeah. I agree with you. I don't remember the classes below me as much as I remember the classes right. above me. There's like a life something there, like looking ahead, want to be older. You yeah, know, a something. Life there. We're not looking Look, behind. Looking like, up to oh, people. I wish again. I was back in fourth grade. I wonder what they're I doing. Really they acted like that kid. Yeah. Yeah. You looked at the bigger kids and the taller kids, and you're like, ooh, I want to be like that. Right. You're older, cooler. They're driving to school. That guy has a mustache. How do yeah, you get a mustache? Growing sideburns. Like, how do you do that? <laughs> right? I, I couldn't grow sideburns until I was like 30. <laughs> so saxophone, you played the saxophone? Well, I played the old tenor saxophone all throughout middle school. Did you? Yeah. yeah the I old jazz tenor. band, regular mm-hmm. band. You guys, there's so much just in just, this. Wor- that's it was wild. kismet, you guys. This, yeah. this podcast today. You were, what were you playing? Uh, I started... Fifth grade, I played the violin, right. and it was horrendous. My parents, I don't, it sounded like cats screeching. It was terrible. And my parents were always the parents that were like, it's Christmas. Hey, come play a song for everybody. That's good. Like, no, this is terrible. Yeah. Uh, and then, so that lasted a year. Sixth grade, my brother and I went to trumpet. So I did trumpet um, in, and then in, in, in junior high, seventh or eighth grade, they, they needed baritone players. And so they asked trumpet players it was basically the same thing. They said, you don't even have to learn how to read bass clef. We'll just teach you. We'll give you treble clef music, but we need a deeper sound. We need sound. a lower end. And so I said, trumpet. sure, that sounds fun. And I yeah. kind of wanted to distance myself from my brother. We were twins, yeah. and we were doing the same thing. I'm like, I'm going to do something different. So then I played baritone. You guys are always trying to do something different. Yeah. You, you kind of had that one-up each other childhood. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Twin. I think I don't, I mean. Twin rivalry. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know if you, if I. We were both guys. I mean, I had we had some friends that were boy-girl twins, and so that's probably a little different. But if you're 
a set of boy twins, I feel like it's impossible not to have that. Mm-hmm. I mean, with brothers, you get that. And then you have yeah. the same age. You're on the same sports teams. You have the same classes. How could you not, as a dude, I don't know, maybe if you're more mature than me and more Correct. healthy. And, and you're you do get a little competitive <laughs> still. Oh, for sure. Still. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. So the mature competitive Kyle. Yeah, that's true. Think about the immature competitive Kyle. We know how that could go. Or the, like if yeah. you get a challenge during the week, you're like, I'm going to rise up to it. I'm going to show you. Yep. Mm-hmm. Might as well. So, hey, Jesse, I, I miss those days, though. That was Those were fun. Yeah. I, my family is very musically inclined. They just, everyone in the family is good at music. So, I miss playing. And you know, fun story. Yeah, I didn't have a, a, a saxophone because I left it at my parents' house and it disappeared. My wife bought me one last, I think it was just last year. She just surprised me with a tenor saxophone. She said, Here you go. And I was like, How much did you spend on this? Right. <laughs> um, she had a small business at the time that we that we gave to our niece, and she used the the last of the small business money to buy me this saxophone. So now I have to like get it out and play it. Yeah, have my you, family. Have you played it much? Yeah, right. yeah. Get the reeds it's, out. We, yeah, it, we it, can throw you up on the worst. It really thing. all came back. You know, it's yeah. like riding a bike. There you go. Uh-huh. It's fun. There's, yeah, I can Skating remember like a scale positions. on like the trumpet. Still, that's about it. Yeah, like my brother could still play trumpet. He played for a long time and still did it, but picking up any of that i'm like i remember like a c major scale and that's that's about yeah. it so jesse hit us when we have guests on we we usually just kind of dive into how how you met jesus is our go-to question how did you find jesus and we've talked about it plenty on the podcast usually we all understand jesus found us how do we respond to what he's doing but with you we'll take extra extra time today for those that are listening in, especially mc folks uh to kind of get to know you Talked about your wife, you, you know, your family, maybe some of your upbringing, just some of the the, the roles and responsibilities you've had uh, in ministry and life, and um, your story of finding Jesus and all of that. So we'll just kind of go through yeah, a bunch yeah. of uh, Jesse's story today. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, man, I I grew up as a church kid, like pretty hardcore church kid, not a pastor's kid, church kid. In a uh, local church here in Spokane, um, it was very, very Pentecostal in, in flavor, which I didn't, I didn't know anything else. So that was just what I knew. But I grew up in the church, learning the stories with the felt boards and all the things. You know, it's like this was just it was part of my life. So but, do you do you remember that like always? There was never time where you like not church. It was just right. always a part of your life. We were very dedicated yeah. to the church. Yeah, my mom would, like, when we went camping, she would drive, like, two hours to come back for church and then come back. Like, the rest of the family would stay. She'd be like, you guys can stay. But, like, she didn't miss service unless wow. we were really way, out of town. Way out of like, town, yeah. yeah. Like, inaccessible. Um, you know, Wednesday night, every every week, it was it was twice a week. We did that. Um, yeah, so I grew up in the church. Uh, but, you know, as a kid, when you're when you're in it, it's just like you're in it. And then you, at a later point, I think everyone has this moment where uh, it's validated in their own heart, so to speak. And I think for me, that was, I can't, I can't put an exact exact time on it, but it was, it was later because I was just, I was there and like, this is cool, you know, like I prayed and stuff, but it wasn't until later that I, I really found uh, Jesus. And it was in, in part coming out of that experience and asking some some deep questions about what I had experienced and um, the truth of the scriptures in relationship to that experience without getting into too much detail. Cause I, I loved that experience, you know, I, mm-hmm. there, there are some, some things, but I also loved that experience. It was the foundation of, of Jesus. And that's what caused me to, to stay in the church and in, in the faith. You know, I had this moment when I was like 18, where it was very much so I could walk away from this or I could dig in for myself and, and, and find some answers and, and figure it out. And I did. I chose that latter, that latter part, and it, it sparked something in me that continues today, uh, which is a love for, for study about theology and the gospel. When you did uh, that, did you give, like, God a little bit of a timeline or yourself? You're like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this a whirl for... St- six months or three months or um or you just kind of were more open-ended because it's normal like for everybody especially if you grew up with a family that was jesus-centered church-centered 
about God, you're like, at some point, you got to figure this out for your, yourself. You go, uh, whether that's 12 years old or 18 or 48, you go, I don't know. I grew up with that. There's good and bads with everybody's family. Introduction to God's awesome. Nobody's got a perfect introduction to God. I didn't as a kid, you know. But at some point, you got to go, all right, what is, it, what is this God, this Jesus thing about? Is this for me? What am I doing with it? Yeah, I think for me it was more informal. It, it wasn't like in my mind I said, you know, this is, this is kind of uh, the statute of limitations where I'm either going to walk away from my faith or continue. Right. It was definitely more informal. But I, I was absolutely at a point where I could have drifted off and, and not given much thought to it. Kind of been okay at that yeah. point in your life. Go, yeah, eh, it's fine if that fades. That was a definite option. Yeah, and, I mean, and, there's that that crossroad moment that you say, like, nah, is it? Am I going to pursue it or not? Right? Or am I going to make it my own? Right. And and especially as you talk about in that those pivotal, you know, adulthood years or becoming entering into adulthood, like, okay, I get, I'm a big boy. I get to make my own decisions. I don't. Mom and dad aren't taking me to church anymore. Yeah. I don't. I don't have to do this because they're telling me or forcing me or because. You know, now when I'm camping, I get to make my own decision. Right. Am I driving back or not? <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> Weird. St- love Jesus more than ever, and I still am not driving back yeah, when I'm camping. Absolutely. absolutely. Me neither. <laughs> yeah. Me neither. I mean, my freshman year, like the first semester, I was like, this is like summer camp. And I'm not, I wasn't connected to a local church. And I'm like, I still love God, but man, yeah. I had to choose a bunch of things in life for myself, not just because mom and dad are saying we're doing this. Well, it's interesting, too, in, in those moments, it, it was absolutely the scaffolding of Jesus that that I held and is what kept me going it wasn't and I, I didn't I don't, th- I don't think I realized this until a little bit later but like I got into like apologetics and like you know these things that are like but it it, it wasn't at all apologetics that kept me uh, that kept me going it was my relationship with Jesus which is which is really cool in retrospect yeah you know you think about that it's like it wasn't that like oh things are irreducibly complex or whatever, you know, like, sure, those are fine. But it wasn't that at all. Maybe at the time I thought like, okay, these things are prompting me to continue. It wasn't. It was, it was totally Jesus. Jesus. Like looking back on that. Yeah, that's super like, cool. Yeah. Because I, I know you, right? And we've had a lot of conversations just about next. And I, I've known you in different contexts from, you know, when you were doing, when we were both doing youth ministry and what your next steps in life were. And, and you're, you underplayed it a little bit, but you're, you're a little bit of a Bible nerd. You love the study and the theology. You have a master's degree. When we were talking for a season, you're like, yeah, I'm going to go get my doctorate. And I'm just going to study the Bible forever in this, you know, really crazy context of brainy. You know way more than I do. And, and so, like, that's you. You love that. But I love yeah, hearing yeah. that because... I mean, I know you a little bit as a Bible nerd, master's degree, love that stuff, could study in doctorate level forever. But you're saying even that wasn't, as much as you love that, wasn't the thing that was like, yep, it was Jesus. And that's all an outflow of Jesus, obviously. But. Right. And almost paradoxically, studying theology is tough, man. It's like you need that foundation. Because there, there are moments that, that challenge you deeply, uh, you know, these philosophical and theological concepts, these things that just kind of blow your preconceived notions out of the water. And yeah, during school, like that, that happened a lot. And if I, same thing, if I hadn't had that scaffolding that is Jesus, um, it would have been, it would have been incredibly difficult. You retreat to that place of devotion when you're working through these, these issues, through these, uh, these tough concepts. That's so good. Yeah. And that's always the place where you find your, your strength. Yeah. And that's part of God's hardwiring is like in the working genius model, you wonder and discernment. You love to sit and ponder things and, and discern those things and what's true and right and how do these go together. And that's the kind of work that is joy filled for you uh, and really enjoyable, right? To, to continue yeah, to pursue definitely. that. So what about it? Um, like, is there anything specific when you say your devotion to Jesus in that time period where you're like, okay, it's my personal relationship with Jesus? Like, is there something there that you remember was really significant as far as, um, like, God's closeness or, or you know, the Holy Spirit's reality in my life, and which kept, kept you on track versus just the pure intellectual pursuit and knowledge pursuit? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I am I'm such a nomad in terms of, like, my tradition and uh, kind of all over the place, but that still that, that Pentecostal background where I, I value the, the presence of God and like thinking back on those, on those times and moments where, where I would retreat to that, you know what I mean? And uh, the felt presence of, of God in my life. And you can't, you can't turn away from that. You don't want to turn away from that. That is, that is the base, you know? Um, 
and that's that's what that's what I would turn to uh, during those moments. And it was uh, it was beautiful because I, I knew, you know, it's like there's no there's no doubt. And then everything else else was just affirmation um, and cool and exciting. And shortly after that, that kind of pivotal moment where I could have e- either drifted away, I felt this irrevocable call to to ministry, to working with people. Uh, and I didn't know exactly what that looked like, but it was it was heavy, like it was God. You know what I mean? Um, and same with my brother, which is interesting. We both felt that uh, during that period of time. And so I submitted to that, and because uh, I was, I don't think I told you guys this. I was like halfway through an exercise science degree, and I at? Uh, at Eastern. Okay. Yeah, and I and I, I was just thinking through that because I'm piecing. I know most of your story, and so I'm piecing through, and I'm like 18, and then I'm like. I know some of the next steps collegiately, and I'm like, what? He's not there yet. What? There's a gap that I'm missing here. So yeah, yeah. So I was, yeah, I was working as a personal trainer, like thinking, okay, this could be, this could be a cool career. Uh, still loving Jesus, like church and stuff. Um, you know, doing some study on my own, and definitely had this, this moment. Um, maybe not an exact moment, but like this period of time where I, I just felt this heavy calling. So I, I transitioned out of that program. I didn't drop out. I transitioned out. (laughs) And strangely enough, I applied at Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma to finish out a bachelor's degree and switch my intent to theology. Uh, And never really looked back from there, you know. But the story continues. And interestingly enough, I didn't enter directly into ministry as a vocation. Like we were super involved in ministry. But I started working with uh, like underserved youth in the West Central area uh, through the through the YMCA, and I did that for about nine years, um, amongst some other things in there. But and worked for the church part time uh, during that period. But an awesome, incredible journey. But still, during that period, I'm like, I know, and I know, there's going to be a point where I transition into vocational ministry because that's uh, I felt that sense of calling. But God prepares us in in wonderful ways. You know, that was looking back like. It was one awesome, two it was what I needed. Prepared me professionally and um, just kind of raised me up in, in in the right way, you know. Yeah, and you got to use your exercise science degree there. No, I did. I did nothing <laughs> with fitness. Well, it's at the YMCA. What? I was just trying to give you half credit. You know, it's partial credit. No, I was completely disconnected. Oh man, it's different department. Okay, well, it's youth in the development s- over here in That's the right. same same house. So we'll call it we'll call it good. Feel good about it. You know, transition out. As you were talking about, you know, just the presence of God in our lives as such a draw and a connection point to keep on following Jesus, you know, I don't know how much we'll get into it today, but in the journey through the Gospel of Matthew here, we're kind of at the spot where it's Jesus getting baptized and it's, you know, John the Baptist leading the way. Um, And he really just talks about that. He talks about the presence of the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm baptizing with water, which is cool. This is great. This is needed, necessary. But soon, the Messiah is going to show up, and he's baptizing with fire. He's baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Um, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says he gives living water that comes from inside of us. And it's the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, in us. Um, and, and again, there's so much to we talk about that from baptism is water. is water on the outside. It's just earthly thing. And then baptism with Jesus is living water inside, spiritual renewal, and it's just always mind blowing for me. Like the God of the universe dwells inside of us collectively, somehow, some way. And as imperfect and as unworthy of people as we are, He His redemptive power has made that possible. And it's what for me keeps me on track with Jesus. Like, where else am I going to go for life? Like, where is there living water? Um, I don't know of any. Yeah, just like Peter, you know. Where else are we going to go? Where are we going to go? I don't know. I've tried a few different things in life. That didn't work. So, yeah. you know, I'm going to stick with Jesus. So you do do uh, not so sciencey, sporty uh, d- youth development, y- YMCA. Yeah. Uh, loving that work, helping Yeah, I d- built, built and developed those programs through that, that time, which was cool. Uh, built some, some cool connections with like Spokane County Juvenile Court. We worked closely with those. They would literally bring us kids from jail like in a van. And, <laughs> and we would hang out together. <laughs> what, well, like, what was one of, the, for example, like, what was one of the programs or something you'd walk with students through, kids through? Yeah, part of what we were doing is, 
we called it like restorative justice. So we're, we're trying to restore them as opposed to the punitive justice that they've already experienced is, which is also how I like to think of, of God's grace and his, um, his justice. Um, but yeah, we, so we, we would take them and we do, we, I mean, we do all kinds of stuff, but we had uh, work programs. We had a lawn care program. So we literally take these kids and like, here, have this lawnmower. And they would go run over hoses and like lo- yard gnomes and stuff. And like, <laughs> it was, it was the real deal. Uh, we had a greenhouse and, you know, community garden, like all this stuff. Um, but more than anything, we would just, we would immerse ourselves in, in their lives. And, uh, I, I tell you that the coolest experiences came out of that is we, we worked alongside them. It wasn't like, Hey, we're directing you. We always had this model of we're going to come alongside you. And we did in other ways too, in providing resources and, um, and sharing, sharing the gospel with them. Um, and that's what kids need, especially a lot of times with kids in those situations. Their yeah. story is like they didn't have a really good adult figure that walked with yeah. them, guided them. And when they're in the court system, it's punishment, punishment, punishment. There's not a lot of opportunities for restoration, unfortunately. But So you wrap that season up. What was next for you? Uh, oh, and hit, hit us with your family. Um, we, oh, we yeah. Got, yeah. <laughs> family. Right, because yeah. along this time There's you a family piece in there. Yeah. You you meet your wife, you get married. Yeah, cool things right? happened during this time that were on the other the other end. Yeah, uh, we we got married, Kaylin and I, in 2008, September of 2008, at the Glover Mansion here in Spokane. Oh. It was a lovely rainy day. <laughs> really? They lit the fire pits. It was delightful. My brother married us. It was cool. Uh, and then we uh, just started building our life here in Spokane. You know. Uh, It was cool. God blessed us during that season. Uh, I was working at the Y, and we got pregnant with our our first kiddo in 2010. Yeah, 2010 going into 2011. And I'm like, we live in this one-bedroom condo on the South Hill. It's tiny. It's like 600 square feet. We love it, but we're like, oh, shoot. You know, and I'm I'm working like 30 hours a week going to school, doing my thing. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And literally, like, a couple days later, my supervisor offers me a promotion to a director-level job, which is, like, a big-person job. Um, Big-person job. Yeah, so now I'm overseeing the programs I was working in, and, uh, you know, it just it just worked out in this in this cool way. Um, and we, we progress along and um, graduate from ORU, grab my, my bachelor's in theology, and... Uh, and progress, and I'm thinking, okay, I, I'm, I'm kind of ready to transition into ministry. Um, but I ended up working at the Y for, for uh, quite a while longer, and then I, I had it in my heart to, to get a master's degree. And we were going to move to Kirkland, actually. I applied at Northwest University and got accepted there. But God kind of closed that door. Yeah, you don't um, you don't want a degree from there. That's, that's, um, that's, no. it's, it's whatever you put into are you, it, you, are you get out of it. <laughs> okay. Every degree... <laughs> Is whatever you put into just it. Just joking. I gotta throw a little it. shade at you because I mean, this week you threw a little shade at me. So turns out Kirkland's like really expensive. Yeah. So we're looking at cost of living <laughs> stuff, and I'm like, I'm like, so we're not gonna move to Kirkland to go to school. <laughs> yeah, especially as a college student. Yeah. Like when I was an undergrad student there, it was very expensive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You gotta live in the apartments, man. Jeez. Yeah. So I I applied at Whitworth and. There's a bit of a of family history there. My dad graduated from Whitworth, and my grandmother was actually uh, the dean of education and one of the first female dean. Wow. Yeah. When so was that? That was back in the day. Wow. I, don't, I couldn't tell you the years. Yeah. yeah I mean. You're, so you're, you're dad's mom? Yes. Okay. So, you, yeah, you guys got a lot of higher education through the, the gene pool. Yeah. And the I was kind of. They're smarty pants. I was kind of scared of Presbyterians, if I'm being honest. <laughs> You know, because we kind of grew up like the we, mainline Protestant church is like, no, no. Uh, so I don't know. No, no. We, <laughs> no, don't do we that. We don't know, like as listeners are listening, <laughs> we don't know people's like faith background. So, you right. know, we're not sure if yeah. any Presbyterians yeah. are listening in. I hope so, because I'm about to give to. them enormous accolades. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. Uh, he Pentecostal, said he was. He was. Baptist. Wor- he was leary. Yeah. I didn't John know. followers. Everybody can listen in. I'm thinking like, yeah, is it? are they just going to push reformed, reformed doctrine? Like, oh, I don't know. And I tell you what, it was. I got accepted and started, and it was it was the coolest experience. I absolutely loved it. Uh, it challenged my thinking in ways that uh, I didn't know were possible. Shaped my my theology and, and belief, 
it didn't impose anything. Uh, the professors were incredible. I still have relationships with a lot of them. Um, it's just a really, like, an awesome experience. Really cool. So I'm glad I ended up going there. Yeah. And, and as a whole, you know, university selection aside, as a whole, it's healthy for all of us to be connected to in relationship with, have conversations with people that are different, a little bit different faith view uh, than us because it challenges us. Yeah. If we just surround ourselves with everybody who agrees and says right. the same thing, we don't actually, you have to work really hard to challenge that group of that community to grow because you're like, oh yeah, we're all on the same page. We all agree. We all agree. We all agree. And if you dig down, we don't all agree. Right. Um, it, it happens. It. I had a conversation yesterday. I was actually at a coffee shop working on a message. I uh, had to wrap that up, head out. As I'm wrapping it up, these two guys sit down on the couch, like directly across, across from me. And they were waiting for a guy who was on the phone. And uh, the two young guys had little name badges. One was Elder So and So, another Elder. They're two Mormon missionaries. And so he's, I got my Bible out, notepad, I got the computer. I'm, got everything out and so then he just strikes up the conversation he was the talkative guy the other guy looked like deathly afraid like he was gonna cry because <laughs> we were in public talking they won on the job yeah and i'm getting older because i'm like are you guys 15 well i was just gonna say did they look like they were 12 yeah, like they were younger, high schoolers younger i was younger. like you guys doing a high school thing like no i'm just that's old guy talk i know but anyways so he just starts chatting it up you know and he's like now what what are, are you like what are you? he's trying to I mean, he sees the Bible. I'm like, yeah, I'm just working on a message. I'm doing a talk here. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, over at Mission Church. I'm on the team there. He goes, on the team. Now, what does that mean? Is that like pastor? Are you like a pastor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, you're called pastor. I'm teaching. What are you teaching on? I was like, cool. So I just gave him like a series outline. And I'm like I like told him the whole message. And he's he's just like, oh, I love I like Jesus too, and I read the Bible too. Do you ever do you ever like read the Book of Mormon? Oh, I've read it. Oh, you have? Yeah. He goes, do you ever teach from it? I go, eh, kind of. And in my head, I thought, well, we have this whole series called High Sounding Nonsense. You might want to tune into that. It would be a little bit different teaching of from the Book of Mormon. That it's kind of different. We're at different. I didn't have time for that. We didn't we didn't really know each other that well. So I just said, yeah. Yeah, I got access to one, and, you know, we just kind of, I was like, I got to go, and your guy's ready, so I'll let you guys get to it, but. <laughs> he's already, he's scared over in the corner. Yeah. Wants you to leave me. Alone. Yeah, but it's good, I mean, it's good to have the interaction right. with different kind of thoughts and views. Yeah, Whether I think, directly opposed, or even just slightly different. I can't remember who it was, somebody, somebody in my life told me one time to always be reading something that you may disagree with, which has served me well, um, I still do that. But yeah, I mean, Whitworth was a contrarian voice to uh, some of some of what was sta a staple at you know like or are you like it, it, just in terms of theology you know conservative approach to the scriptures and like viewing dates and things like that. So it was it was just cool cool to have the the information and access to it. Whereas like I didn't I didn't get any of that. Like it was hidden from me. Like like someone was protecting me from it. You know. So I appreciated being able to have it and make decisions for myself um, moving forward. So maybe that's just graduate and undergraduate difference. I don't know. But anyway, cool experience. Yeah. And so along this time, you got you guys have a, you move out of that condo, right? And then you, uh, yeah. you have a couple more kiddos. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, we did. Yeah. So 2013, Ruth comes along, um, our second. And well, hold on. I want to back up. So the first, the first kid was absolutely terrifying we had this like terrible experience birthing and we ended up having to have like an emergency c-section and it was just like oh my gosh you know so we're, we're like do we want to do this again and yeah. we did and the second birth was just amazing like just smooth and we were there for like 12 hours you know at the hospital uh and we go along and you know same thing just progressing through life and um master's degree and then we we decide to have one more work kiddo and, and Jane comes along in 2017 uh which is just so wonderful three girls and we we always get asked the question like you're gonna go for the boy like every time and I'm like I'd be happy with another girl like this is wonderful I love I love it so yeah and here we are and, and during that time we we started working um part-time for a for a church yeah, as youth pastors and you know on speaking team and just kind of started to progress in that in that way and as as God does you know he's leading us and of course me I'm like I'm ready to go like 
God, give me this big church or something. Like, let's do it. You know, he's like, take some steps, take some steps. Like, <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Um, so, yeah, just, just focused on ministry and then transitioned full time. And, um, yeah, just haven't really looked back. So, and your oldest daughter's Tennessee. Yeah. And I love that name. Is that like a family thing? You guys just like it? You were in Tennessee or... Uh, I mean, I think it's fun. It's a beautiful name. Yeah. It's just a little different. So, like. Right. There's People ask that. There's really not any significance behind it other than we, we liked it. Um, I've never been to Tennessee, if I'm being honest. Okay. Yeah. Me neither. And that's what we get to do as I've, parents. I've been there. We get to pick the name. Yeah. Kyle's working on that. I, well, I out, am, yeah. I've, I've thrown out a few suggestions. Yeah. Scott, lots, Scooter. Lo- lots of people have. <laughs> lots of people. How we many went, people? We went with one very... Ch- very non-traditional and then too traditional. I mean, Ruth and Jane are, yeah. you know, it's like, those are classics. Those are classics. Yeah. 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 Do you guys, uh, how, where are you at in the name process? For Here's where the I'm at. Baby we, as in we, like my wife thinks about it way differently than I do, obviously. Right. Um, I, I'm waiting. February 8th is our appointment where we have our ultrasound. We find out the gender of the baby. Ooh. Uh, and that's coming up. I'm waiting. I don't want to get invested in all these names, even if it's like, ooh, this or by the score. I'm waiting. To get fully invested, I know it's a boy, then I'm going to start thinking about boy names. I know it's a girl, I'm going to start thinking about girl names. Do you got some in the pot? Though? I like a little Eat. bit. Lindsay's got a list on her, her thing, and she throws them out to me. I don't have a lot that I'm like, ooh, I really like this. Every now and then I'll think, like, that's a good one, but then I'll, like, forget it. So I'm not even fully Are you guys, there like, like Bible name people, or you doesn't does really matter? No, it doesn't really matter. She threw yeah. that out in, in bed the other night, like, as we're going to sleep. She's like, you want to, like, do, like, a Bible name? What, what do you think? And then I, then me, I just start having fun with it and throwing out like really the bad horrible ones. ones. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, no. stop, no, I'm serious. That's, yeah, that's not gonna work. <laughs> uh, so, do you think she's got a, f- a front runner? If it's like boy, she's like, oh, here's my no. Top she's got one, a couple girl. that she likes that she keeps throwing out. I don't think she has a front runner. I was funny uh, at Fusion last night for our youth ministry. She's she's a middle school girl, small group leader, and uh, we had a message. And so we normally meet as a leadership team, like, hey, how'd it go? How'd your guys' small group go? What can we do better? And we had a little bit smaller of a group. Some colds are going around and stuff. And so week to week, it's kind of weird. And so, and they were just kind of a little rowdier last night. Youth ministry sometimes it's just weird. So the girl small groups were like, yeah, our small groups were a little off topic. And then Lindsay goes, yeah, we mostly just had baby name suggestions in our small group. I'm like, that's what you get. She's like, yeah, the girls just wanted to talk about what we should name our baby. It's just real spiritual. Yeah. Okay. Just hel- helping you out. Just community. Yeah. I, I, my advice: Don't tell anybody your your potential names because they always people always have an opinion. They're like, you know, you're like, I'm gonna name name her Debbie, and they're like, I knew it, oh, Debbie. I ha- oh, I, I hate, hate that Debbie. Oh, I hate the name Debbie. Yep. They're like, you know. Yeah, we've talked, and we again, we <laughs> like, do, have doing youth ministry for so long, being in ministry, being in a lot of intentional community with people. Right? There's always opinions, so we're just we're gonna go with it and yeah. figure it out. Like, Sorry, de- Debbie, out there. <laughs> yeah. Right, Debbie. Did you catch when like all the COVID, like during COVID, like, people having babies, they're naming them weird stuff around COVID and pandemic and that kind of stuff. Did you hear about no. that? No. Oh, that's terrible. Somebody, yeah. If you got some time on your hands idea. listening, yeah, Google, some, Google that. There like people, Elon Musk. That's just child abuse. Yeah. Like he, that, there should be there should be legal ramifications on what you can and can't name. What did he kid. name his kid? You can't even say it. It's, it's like a, symbols. It's like a math equation. Yeah. It's like, and he says there's a way to pronounce it, but it's like a backwards A and an E thing that's like some sort of scientific math. I guess when you're the richest man on earth, you can yeah. name your kid whatever you want. Sure, yeah. You can be weird. Yeah. Anybody can be weird, regardless of money. <laughs> like in 2020, you think any girl was born named Karen? No. Probably not. Yeah, you know, know what I mean? Like yeah. the no. stigma around I mean, maybe, that. Yeah, I mean, maybe if someone was not aware and it was like named after grandma or something, you had to go yeah. Karen. Like I just, I just love the name Karen. Yeah. You're like again, but at some point people are like, Yeah, it's a family name. We're like, I don't care what you think and I don't care what society's done to Karen, we're still gonna yeah. go with it. Yeah. Here's a here's a funny story kind of about names. So so Jane, her actual legal first name is Matilda, named after my grandmother. Okay. And her middle name is Jane. But we, we did that with the intention of always calling her Jane because uh that's just what we decided. Was your grandma a Jane as no. well? No. Okay. She was Matilda. Yeah, but not Matilda. But she went Jane. by Tilly. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so Matilda Jane Richner, MJ Richner. And so get this. <laughs> she's she's born on uh 420, which is like if nobody probably knows this cuz we're all good Christians, but that's like the pot holiday of the world or I don't know. I don't really know what the significance, but we're thinking like shoot her 
Her initials are MJ. Oh, Mary Jane, man. Yeah. And she was born on 420. And we're like, we don't, we don't want people to think we're like potheads or something. And then we're like, you know what? Whatever. This is our name. We picked it out. We locked it. Like, they can get over it. Like, <laughs> but we, in the hospital, we almost changed the name because we thought of that. We were like, really? we, we need to like scramble and come up with a different name. And we're like, no, that's crazy. And we asked the nurse, we we're like, what do you think? And she was like, I don't, I, yeah, I don't, th- I don't think people would make that association. <laughs> If it was Mary Jane, 420. <laughs> yeah, that might be, be a like, little different. Matilda Jane, though. Matilda's wholesome. Like, yeah. Matilda would never. Cl- classy. Yeah. You think yeah. Matilda, you think it's classy. Ma- Matilda's giving you the lecture about not smoking. Exactly. Yeah. And she would have. She would have smacked, smacked you right across the face. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so <laughs> so more of your story. You got three beautiful girls, and you're, you're working uh, at some churches in the valley. Yeah. Experiences there. Yeah, um, man, we, yeah, doing ministry and stuff, it's, it's been, uh, I will say like the single, you know, the single greatest blessing in my life outside of like family and stuff has just been pouring into people's lives. Um, I always say, you know, it just, like in that youth sermon I did the other week, it just, it doesn't feel like, like work, um, doing ministry, um. Some of my fondest memories come from from those years and these times. Uh, yeah, you shared with great. those you shared with those students, and we've talked a lot about this on on the podcast because we've had a lot of pastors come and share of their calling into ministry and their idea and going. It's it's what we always talk about with our sweet spot and that God hardwiring that when you're functioning in your sweet spot the way that you're supposed to, it's life giving. It's not draining. When you're in a genius that you're in a role that is the way you were designed, it, it gives life. I mean, you, you shared the example with the students of, you know, we've all been in jobs where they were draining and you hated it because you weren't in your sweet spot. You were doing it either just for the paycheck or um, Sarah Cottom a few weeks ago shared about her job right now. It's not ministry context, but her job is so life-giving. She's in her sweet spot and she's like, I love going to work. This is why I was made. I can do this in my sleep and it's fun. I leave work and it's like, yeah. And for me, I don't understand how people can have a sweet spot that isn't ministry. And I'm like... <laughs> Like what you love your job as an accountant and like it's a blessing for you. I'm like that. I I don't get which, it. That's amazing. Which yeah. is like, ministering to people. Absolutely. Yeah. Like Sarah would probably yeah. push back if she was here. Yeah. She was like, no, my job is ministry, buddy. Yeah. Like I remember right. that. Talk I vividly remember that as a middle school student because I didn't grow up in church and start going to youth group because my buddies invited me. Hit the ground running, gave my heart to the Lord, and then I was like, I'm doing this. I'm doing ministry. And I remember having that conversation with my friends as like a middle schooler. Like, oh, you want to be a doctor? Weird. Like. You don't want to, like, just be in youth ministry forever and, like, preach to people and talk? I'm like, I thought that's our sweet spot. Like, I thought that's what you're supposed to do in this churchy thing. No, they're like, bro, I have a brain. I don't want to hang out with students all (laughs) the time. No, I don't I don't want to do that. I want to be a teacher. I want to be a doctor. Like, I remember having those, like, I want to do this sports thing. I'm like, weird. And I had to, like, relate and understand the difference between this ministry context and who I was and my gifting and my sweet spot. Right, and and vocational that. ministry yep. as opposed to the ministry that all believers undertake. You know, it's like, uh, yeah. And different. I think there's a large part that I don't think gets covered. Maybe this is just my take on it. You guys speak speak on this as well. I don't think it gets covered as well as far as um, just, I don't even know the right words, not resigning yourself but accepting that this is the role that God's given me in life and not fighting against that as, as part of the discovery. And I probably not even going to do a great job trying to express this, um, but just kind of settling into the role and the amount of faith and the position and the responsibility. And sometimes we want to push back on that and we look at other people's lives and we go, I do want that. And you, you do want to be a, t- a doctor, man, maybe I want that. That looks more glamorous. And I think we miss out on so much of the fullness of life and the satisfaction of life that Jesus prom- promises and offers when not only when we're not operating in our sweet spot, when we settle into like, this is the season I got right now. These are like, for, you know, this is my family. I got three kids at home. Like, this is who I am and I need to do well with this. Uh, like, you know, John the Baptist probably didn't grow up picking that dude, you want to be the weird guy out in the desert, like wearing like weird clothes. People think you're the like loony hippie dude talking about repentance and the kingdom of God. Is that what you want? You know, it's like third grade. Like when I grow up, I'm going to be camel hair, woven clothing, wearing, you know, weirdo in the desert. Like, okay. But he jumped into that. Like, I don't know how he got there, but like settled into that and said, okay, this is what God has for me. And he was full on 
into that role. Um, so I, I just think that's something we all kind of struggle with, push on. And I think the more that we can settle into like, this is the, my spot today. This is my season. This is who yeah. I am. That's, uh, that's honestly been tough for me. I'm, if you're an Enneagram person, I'm an Enneagram 7. And discontent has always been something that, that I struggle with. Because I, not so much because I'm like, oh, this, this is a bummer, but because I want to like be moving forward. There's an Enneagram song about Enneagram 7. And it says, if you're standing still, it feels like you're sinking. And I'm like, that's like the story of my life, you know. So God has definitely taught me through the, the seasons to be more content. And, you know, the grass is always greener. It's like I look back on my time. I get the Y, for example. I really enjoyed it. But there was also this underlying discontentment where I was like, but why am I why am I not in like vocational ministry when that's what you called me to do? You know, so I had this like underlying frustration during that period of time. Um, but even now, like I can look back on those years and say like and see exactly what God was doing and and see how amazing those times like lifelong friends, um, the students, like they still I still keep in touch with them, like they're grown up now, like they're adults and like calling me up and like, hey, let's get together. I'm like, yes, please. So that's that has been a perennial struggle for me, but something that I've come to terms with. Um, but I, I wonder, like, John, you know, was he content out in the wilderness? <laughs> like, or did he have those thoughts? Like, right. Did he man, have buddies that he yeah. hung out with on the weekend? Right. Or like, you know what I mean? His life, the way he thought it was going to go versus what is in. You have to wonder, was he out there thinking like, like am I crazy? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. He, I don't know. But I just think that's, I think it's helpful for all of us. And not that we don't grow and we challenge yourself and like god what do you got for us and we you know do yeah, different no. things but settle into what god ha- has for us and who we are absolutely and I, as i hear you think of that i think of that more now even in our society where we it's so easy for us to draw lines and delineate between success and and not success and you know well i am a past you know it's the conversation with the the missionary guys the two like, elders. Oh, oh you're a pastor right you're a teacher like What's your role, and what are where have we elevated you? Where can we celebrate you and, and who you are? And because you make more money, or you've got more degrees, or you are a pastor, you're not just that that guy on the team. Like, no, I want to know that you say that you have the word pastor behind your name, or you're this successful, or you're that, or you do this, and we we draw all these lines and delineate between success and and power and authority, um, and so it's even more easier in our world just to think. Uh, you know, this person is better or more successful or uh, more influential. Yeah, more influential. I mean, that's, that, that's more desirable. Your role is more desirable. And I'm just little old me over here. I'm just helping kids at the Y, but I'm not a youth pastor, right? Like going, you know, Sarah, like you say, she would probably push back. Like I'm ministering to, to all these construction workers in planning events and doing all these things. And I'm able to show them the love of Jesus and share my story and what God's done and the power. Like, that's ministry right there, right? And understanding that, and again, we we as pastors, um, in our vocational calling, it's just a little different. But we all right. have this thing that God's this designed by God, this sweet spot to serve in Him and love Him in that. And I, I agree. I, we talk about this all the time. We need to kind of cut through a lot of those barriers and understand the way that God calls us. There, he, there He is, and here's all of us. And what what can we do to to love Him and love each other well in that? Yep. And to, you know, settle into what God has for us, to influence the responsibility we have this week and follow in him that we could take full advantage of that and not sit around and desire different and more in somebody else's life, but the life that God has for us. Yeah, that's, and that's a beautiful thing, really. Uh, someone that I look up to, I don't know if you guys have heard of Brother Lawrence, he wrote this little book. It's actually like letters collection because he didn't want to write a book, but he was uh, like a, a priest essentially at a monastery, but he was the cook, but he lived this life of contentment in the presence of, of Jesus. And when you read through his letters, he, he speaks of his life and his responsibilities, um, as this beautiful opportunity to spend time in the presence, you know, in, he says in the business of the kitchen, um, it's the same as if I were before the altar, you know? And I remember reading that and thinking how often I felt like discontented with the season that I was in and I'm like, mm, I'm missing it. Like I'm, I'm missing it right there. You know what I mean? And I, and still like, I still have those things. I think we all do. Um, but that's something I, I like strive for now is to be content in the season that I'm in, whether that's the cook, so to speak, or 
you know, whatever. Yeah. So good. Paul says that godliness with contentment is great gain. Yep. And so maybe that'll help you as you're following Jesus this week to settle into uh, how you're connecting with him personally and growing intentionally with others and the way that God uh, has hardwired you and the opportunities ahead of you to serve others, uh, that you would just kind of settle into that and excel in what God has for you. Jesse, thanks for being on the podcast today. Thanks for sharing a, a bit of your story and who you are. And um, Jesse's going to probably be more of a regular part of the podcast going forward. So uh, we'll have lots of time to talk about uh, you know Matthew 3. And as we go along here, uh, Craig's on a little bit of vacation today. He's probably enjoying some beach somewhere. In Texas? He's in Texas, Texas. Uh, vacationing. So anyways, thanks for tuning in this week. Have a great week following Jesus. We'll talk with you soon. <laughs>